Greetings and welcome back to room 303 in our talks with Walt as we are calling our readings through the deathbed edition of Walt Whitman's Leaves of Grass. We are now coming to the end of the drum tap section and we're going to now read a little poem, Spirit Whose Work Is Done, poem number 40 of the 43 of drum taps. I find this a fascinating little poem at the conclusion of drum taps especially because of his use of the word spirit. Six times it's going to get used. You'll maybe recall, and we've been saying this to all of these lectures in Drum Taps, that in To the Old Cause, a poem early on in uh, Leaves of Grass in the, in the, uh, in the uh, inscriptions section, he said, my book and the war are one. And we've been talking about the different ways that that happens. But um, right after that line, a line that we haven't quoted until now, he says, merged in its spirit. And we're going to find that this word spirit is, I think, central to our reading of this, of this poem. Now, our assumption is that you've been with us at LearnStrong.net from the very beginning. Our Talks with Walt is the playlist down the left-hand side of that website. And you've been with us, hopefully, from the very beginning, and you're annotating your copy of Leaves of Grass. Several of you are reporting to me that this is interesting to learn how to annotate by just reading poem after poem. We've given a set of introductory comments for drum taps, and we just worked with uh, Low Victress. Now, our Nortons, as we always will return to Nortons to give us some background information, tells us this poem first appeared in the sequel of 1865-66, and with minor revision has remained in drum taps through all editions. The title note, Washington City, 1865, was added in 1871. This poem written um, after watching the Grand Review in May of 1865, and we've seen this already um, in, in earlier poems, you'll you'll see right away a difference though in tone from the beginning of drum taps when for example we're going to hear about the stretched uh, tambrum to now uh, uh, in, in first O oh, songs for uh, play, uh, prelude to now what we will what we will hear and witness in this one spirit whose work is done Washington City 1865 note um, how solemn uh, uh, as one by one uses the exact same kind and I think they're good companion reads spirit whose work is done spirit of dreadful hours ere departing fade from my, uh, my eyes your forests of bayonets spirit of gloomiest fears and doubts yet onward ever unfaltering pressing spirit of many a solemn day and many a savage scene electric spirit that with muttering voice through the war now closed like a tireless phantom flittered, rousing the land with breath of flame, while you beat and beat the drum. Now as the sound of the drum, hollow and harsh to the last, reverberates around me, as your ranks, your immortal ranks return, return from the battles, as the muskets of the young men yet lean over their shoulders, as I Look on the bayonets bristling over their shoulders as those slanted bayonets, whole forests of them appearing in the distance approach and pass on, returning homeward, moving with steady motion, swaying to and fro to the right and left, evenly, lightly rising and falling while the steps keep time. Spirit of ours I knew, all hectic red one day, but pale as death next day. Touch my mouth ere you depart. Press my lips close. Leave me your pulses of rage. Bequeath them to me. Fill me with currents convulsive. Let them scorch and blister out of my chance when you are gone. Let them identify you to the future in these songs. I find this a remarkable poem, the way that it builds in crescendo to the end where you have a poet asking, for inspiration and it sounds very much like an invocation to a muse. It often has been asked what is America's great epic? I mean uh, every culture that's of any importance has an epic. Uh, what is ours? And Whitman will give two arguments. He'll say well Leaves of Grass is our epic but truly the true epic is America and America's proceeding through history. Notice he begins with the word spirit and again it takes us back to the old cause. Um, and I think that Whitman's readers would immediately identify a poem like this with the uh, Gospel of John, the 19th chapter and the 30th verse, when Christ on the cross will utter, it is finished. And I think that's what's going on here. Or is it just beginning? Spirit whose work is done, spirit of, notice it's dreadful hours, that is to say, drum taps. Ere departing, 
fade from my eyes here. Forests of bayonets. We'll come back to these forests later. Of course, that's compelling given so many of the fights that would happen in the forest. Spirit of gloomiest fears. By the way, the only time gloomiest gets used in all these grass is right here. And doubts. I think that's central to a theodicy. Because you've got to ask the question, what does all this mean? And can it mean anything? Maybe it just doesn't mean anything. Doubts. Yet, notice in parenthetics, and here's this again, theodicy. Yet, onward, ever unfaltering pressing. In other words, evolution. Spirit of many a solemn day, many a savage scene. We've seen that for sure. Electric spirit that with muttering voice, muttering, not clear, through the war, now closed, like a tireless phantom flitted. Now, we've seen this idea of the phantoms of the old coming back. Think of Boston Ballad, for example. Rousing the land with breath of flame. Think about our dragon at the conclusion of our Beowulf poem. We've given full lectures on it at LearnStrong.net. While you beat and beat the drum. Now, this, of course, taking us back to earlier poems. But now, as the sound of the drum hollow and harsh, in other words, the sound of the drum has changed. Before, it was exciting. Now, not so much. Notice the energy now reverberates around me. As your ranks, your immortal ranks return, obviously they're thinned ranks because so many young men died in the war, return from the battles as the muskets, notice the repetition here of as, 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 for this anaphoria happening, as the muskets of the young men yet lean over their shoulders and yet somehow the posture is perceived as different. It's a brilliant little line to show that the men carry their, muzzle, their, their, their uh, muskets somehow a little bit differently as they return. As I look on the bayonets bristling over their shoulders, this word bristling will take us back to our study of Milton and Paradise Lost. You can go back and look at our comments there. We've given full lectures on Paradise Lost at LearnStrong.net. As those, we're back to it, slanted bayonets, whole forests of them appearing in the distance, approach and pass on, returning homeward. I think this word homeward is a fascinating word because that's the key, I think, in this poem, and I think that's the key of Whitman's Theodicy. The young men and women all went back home, but they weren't young anymore, and they certainly were changed in fundamental ways, and yet back to home they go. Moving with steady motion, swaying to and fro. Notice it's almost like the movement of history is the movement of the ocean. Swaying to and fro to the left and right. Of course, left and right can also be read politically here. Evenly, lightly, again, stacking words that end with L-Y. Rising and falling while the steps keep time. It's almost like music. Spirit of hours. Notice we're back to spirit of dreadful hours in the opening line. I knew. In other words, I went through it. All hectic red one day. We think, of course, of, of uh, Shakespeare's uh, Macbeth with hectic red one day. But pale as death next day. Again, I told you guys, coloration in drum taps matters. And then, strangely, after all of that, he asked the spirit to give him a kiss. Touch my mouth, ere you depart. Inspiration. Again, this is pure invocation of the muse. Press my lips close. Now notice it can be close or close. You get to decide. Leave me your pulses of rage. Bequeath them to me. Fill me with currents convulsive. It's interesting, this idea of leave and leaves of grass. In other words, there has got to be something out of all of this experience. I think he's channeling, of course, Lincoln's Gettysburg Address. There's got to be something that I can use from all of this to be able to have a response. Let them scorch. That is to say, these, cor these currents. Notice again the movement currents. Let them scorch and blister out of my chance when you are gone. In other words, after the war, there's got to be something that remains, something valuable. Let them identify you to the future in these songs. This idea of touching my mouth, I think, works so brilliantly with Pushkin's great classic poem, The Poet, uh, The Prophet, that I want to come back to it in a moment. Of course, in the future, suggests that Whitman is the poet of the future America. We saw this, of course, in Brooklyn Ferry. We've seen it so many times that Whitman is speculating that he will be read and appreciated. He will be held um, in the future. Obviously, our talks with Walter validating that hope of his. At 2A, I think he makes the argument that the true poet evolves along with the nation. The true poet speaks to the future, and we commented on this Elsewhere, when we've talked about Milton and Shakespeare and other great, uh, other great writers and poets like Emily Dickinson, they're way ahead of their time. They're way before their time. They speak to a future time. 
And to me, I love the repetition of spirit six times in this poem over and over again. I think of Shelley's Ode to the West Wind, no question, but I really think of Pushkin's Prophet, and I've given a full uh, set of comments on this poem at learnstrong.net. You can run that one uh, to ground if you're so interested. But the poem runs like this. Tormented by the thirst for the spirit, there we are with the spirit, I was dragging myself in a somber desert, and a six-wind seraph appeared unto me on the parting of the roads. With fingers as light as a dream, mine eyes he touched, and mine eyes opened wise like the eyes of a frightened eagle. He touched mine ears, and they filled with din and ringing, and I heard the trembling of the heavens, and the flight of the angels' wings, and the creeping of the polyps in the sea, and the growth of the vine in the valley, and he took hold of my lips, and out he tore my sinful tongue with its empty and false speech, and the fang of the wise serpent between my terrified lips, he placed with bloody hand. An oak he cut with sword my breast, and out he took my trembling heart, and a coal with flaming blaze into the open breast he shoved like a corpse. I lay in the desert, and the voice of God unto me called, Arise, O prophet, and listen and guide. Be thou filled with my will, and going over land and sea, fire with the word the hearts of men. This 1826 poem, is one of the most sacred in all of Russian literature with good cause. And I think it's such a beautiful companion read to this poem. Finally, at 3B, uh, as we're trying to own a poem like this, um, are the greatest poets and artists in your estimation always about helping the future relate to the past? You'll remember that Yeats will call it monuments of unaging intellect in his sailing uh, to Byzantium, a poem that we've talked about. I think Whitman is challenging us here at the conclusion of Drum Taps to look to the future. I hope so. Thank you.